Hello, welcome and good evening, and another Let's Code episode, but this one is sort of like a bug fix. Someone told me that my code doesn't work on a real machine, and indeed, it works on DOSBox, but not on a real machine. Have a listen. When we start the code, it starts to play, but then suddenly it begins to loop, and uh, it doesn't work. The question is why? Because DOSBox emulates a PC, right? A DOS PC. But it turns out, emulation is not perfect, and many things run on a DOS box that won't work on a real machine, and when you try to quit here, it gets even worse, and you get a ton of stuttering and stuff. So let's quit this here. So I had a few assumptions what might be going wrong here, but actually I spent at least two hours coding and fixing things before I had all the solutions that made the program work. And I must say a lot of thanks to who pointed out that it doesn't work. It shows that you should always test on real hardware. And in the following I will need to show you a couple of slides which explain the PC hardware a bit more before we can dive into what I actually changed. So please bear with me. So to explain how all this happened and what we need to uh, take in account, into account before our program works, we need to understand a bit about the PC architecture. So I'll give you a very quick uh, recap of the PC architecture. The original IBM PC, the 5150, was based on the Intel 8088 and 8086 CPU. The 8088 was a cheaper version with an 8-bit data bus, the 86 had a 16-bit data bus, but both had 20 bits of address bus for up to 1 megabyte of RAM. More RAM was possible with bank switching in the form of EMS, expanded memory. But yeah, that's what you got back in the day. The architecture itself looked more or less like this. You had the CPU, which would use its address and data lines to talk over the so-called ISA bus to all the peripherals, and the peripherals would be the interrupt controller for controlling interrupt requests from hardware, the DMA controller for direct memory access and memory transfers, then of course the RAM, which was in the base machines only a few hundred kilobytes but up to one megabyte, and then you had expansion cards, something like the Sound Blaster card, which would be programmed and use DMA, IRQ and I.O. ports to talk to the CPU. And therein lies the problem. So, first of all, the first problem we have with our program is it needs a certain memory model. And to understand the memory model, we need to take a look at how the 8086 actually talks to hardware or to, to the RAM on a hardware level, um, we have first of all a bunch of registers. That's small 16-bit wide storage spaces directly on the CPU. And these are the general registers, the primary and the base accumulator, counter accumulator and the other accumulator, AX, BX, CX and VX. Then we have the segment registers, which are used to choose which region of memory we're using. Also four registers, CS, DS, ES, and SS. The CS uh, is the code segment, which points to the program that's currently executed. DS is the data segment for default, def defaulting to um, which data we load. And SS is the stack segment for making function calls and stuff like that. And furthermore, there are some special purpose registers, the source and destination index for move operations where you copy stuff the base pointer and the stack pointer for stack manipulation, the instruction pointer, which points to the current instruction in the current code segment, and various CPU flags, which tells you if there's an overflow or sign flags or whatever. The segments um, that you can talk to are overlapping, because with a 16-bit register you can only address up to 64 kilobytes of RAM, but using one segment register and one uh, other register you can address more. So memory segmentation works like follows. As I said, we have the four segment registers for code, data, extra and stack. And together with the general purpose register or the special purpose registers, you can address one megabyte. For example, the pair of DS for the data segment and SI for the source index 
gives us some arbitrary one megabit uh, position in memory, megabyte uh, position in memory. So that's, for example, um, to get a linear address, you take ds, multiply it by 16, because every segment uh, follows the next after 16 bytes, but every segment is still 64 kilobytes, 64 kilobytes. So you calculate ds times 16 plus si to get a linear address. Segments can and do overlap, uh, so that's just fine. And if we do a uh, copying in memory, we can use the assembler instruction wrap for repeat and the move string word command, mof sw. And this will copy words, so 16 bit values, from the source address that is dssi to the destination address esdi. This is all implicit, you don't have to write that. The CPU will use those values in those registers and a rep will run for a number of times and the number of times is stored in the CX register. And this is how that works and you can basically in your program choose any segment that you want. However, the problem now is that we have so-called near and far pointers. To save memory, compilers can use so-called near pointers. Instead of the two 16-bit values, one segment register and one um, offset register, you can use just one 8 or 16-bit offset instead. So that you can address 256 bytes or 64 kilobytes in the current segment. This will save a lot of space, of course, because uh, whenever you have to store an address, you simply store 8 or 16 bits instead of 32 bits, because otherwise you need to store the segment register somewhere in memory and the offset register. And this is, of course, a huge memory um, saving and also kind of saving speed because less code has to be loaded or decoded from memory. And that's better. So down here we can see an example. We can move, um, so, so the move uh, mnemonic in the Intel syntax does the target first and then the source second. So MOF SI square brackets BP means load whatever is stored at address BP and move it to the SI register. And the same goes for the DI register, but take the address that's stored in BP at 2, so 16 bits on top of that, and take that value, what's whatever's there, and then do the wrap MOF SW that you already know. And this is using near pointers, uses less space to um, put that into a program, but this is equivalent to writing MOF SI DSBP. And here you would need to store the value that is in DS as well. Of course, this is just encoding registers here, so this is a bit of a theoretical example. The assembler wouldn't put the DS or its value directly in there, but you might have some hard-coded uh, point pointers there, or for example, you load first load uh, a segment and an offset from memory into the address registers, and that's of course slow and takes memory. So this is a bit of a simplified example. The implementation here is actually pretty safe, but the compiler has to be tweaked to that. So we learned about near and far pointers and what they're doing, and in DOSBox, for some reason, this works all by itself. But uh, on a real machine, this might give very weird um, results. So if you go in Turbo C to the Options and Compiler menu, you will see the point model. And if you press F1 here, you get a little help. This menu offers the different memory model switches available in Turbo C. The memory model chosen determines the method of memory addressing. So the default is small, the small memory model, and we want to go for at least compact. So let's see what the small memory model does. This model has 64 kilobytes for code and another 64 kilobytes for data and stack. So that's not, that's not a lot. In, in DOS, without any DOS extenders, you can use 640 kilobytes of code and data and stack all in all. So this uses only like 10% for the code and 10% for data and stacks. This is really, really a small program. 
And the second part is actually the important one. All functions and data pointers are near by default. So whenever we allocate something or pass something around, it will only pass a near pointer, so only the offset. And this might lead to problems, especially when using malloc and allocating the DMA buffer. It could be um, that it doesn't work. Uh, here it actually does work, um, but let's first see what the difference is. So when we go to compact, this is the first model where it says all functions are near by default and all data pointers are far by default. So that's what's uh, important to us. We don't have a big code base, so we our code probably fits into 64k and thus function pointers are fine that they are near and we don't use function pointers here anyway. So that's that's okay. Oh, actually we do. We do for the uh, IRQ handler. But we'll come to that in a minute. But anyway, the compact should be fine. But if you're not um, happy with that, you can even go bigger. You can go to large or huge. So the large memory model allows for up to one megabyte of code, 64 kilobits of stack, and one megabyte for the heap. And all functions and data pointers are far. So there should be no problem at all. And we have one more, the huge memory model. This gives multiple data segments, each 64K in size, up to one megabyte for code and 64K for stack. All functions and data pointers are assumed to be far. Um, so it doesn't even say that it limits to one megabyte for the uh, data segments, but only 64K uh, each. But uh, I would guess without having protected mode or anything else, uh, there's probably not nothing to do here. Um, to extend this above one megabyte, you would need like EMS and its API to crack that. So usually um, you would go for the compact or large, depending on your program size. Uh, this will make, of course, your code a bit larger, as, as I said, and runtime performance may be a bit worse. But uh, for these instances, it should be chosen. However, um, right now I have compiled it for a small memory model. So let's run that. And you see it simply works in DOSBox. It might not work on a real machine because DOSBox emulation isn't perfect. And I can switch to compact and rebuild by saying compile to obj and make exe file link the exe file and then just run and it of course also works no problem here so that's that and uh, the next thing is actually the second bug that i had in my code is the irq handling which is also a bit different in dosbox from a real machine so irqs what are they where do they come from let's take a look at the actual ISA bus socket. So this is one of the sockets where you plug in your sound cards and all the other stuff. Actually, it's an 8-bit socket as was used on the original IBM PC. There's a 16-bit extension for 80s and upwards, but we won't talk about that. And there's a bunch of interesting pins here. So first of all, you have the data pins. It's an 8-bit bus, so you have eight data pins where all the data goes, which is sent to any of the devices. And which device? Well, for that you have the address lines. Every address is either a memory address or an I.O. port address. And that will tell the device if the data that's currently flowing on the bus is for it or not. Then we have the IRQ lines. Every device on the ISA bus can take one of those IRQ lines. And in the original PC you have IRQ lines 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. 0 and 1 are not available, and they can be used. Whenever the device says, I need something done, it will trigger this line and the CPU will answer and execute an IRQ handler for especially this interrupt. For example, the Sound Blaster will trigger the IRQ 5 or 7, depending on how it's configured, and the CPU will start calling your IRQ handler that we programmed into our Sound Blaster code. 
and uh, that will deal with, for example, loading the next sample. And of course, there's the DRQ lines, the direct memory access DMA lines, um, and they are for requesting direct memory access and acknowledging direct memory access. There are three channels, actually four channels, on the original IBM PC 0, 1, 2, and 3. And with the AT, this was extended, obviously, to uh, twice the size, and the same goes for the IRQs. But again, we won't talk about that, but uh, from a software point of view, this is almost the same. There's a few things to uh, take into account, but basically it stayed the same. And then there's the I.O. ports, uh, which I mentioned. They reuse some part of the address lines. The first 10 address lines can be used. And the IOW and IOR lines will be um, triggered when an IO port is read or written. That's when we, for example, talk to the base address of the sound cluster, usually the 220 hexadecimal. When we send stuff to the uh, DSP, we will use the in or out functions and it will trigger the IOW or IOR uh, flags and send the appropriate address. And the sound cluster will know, okay, now someone is talking to me. So this is all fine and good. Uh, let's take a look at the code and what's actually going wrong there. Okay, so you probably do remember that somewhere in the code uh, we did have, do have this function here. This is the void interrupt SB IRQ handler. And the code word interrupt is specific to Turbo C and DOS and it's not available in standard C. And it means that this is a special function that's actually an interrupt handler and will be used as such. It gets some extra magic code around it. And, well, before the changes, it worked in DOSBox, but not particularly well on a real machine. And the reasons are twofold, I think. Um, so first of all, what you should do when you enter an IRQ handler is to actually disable all other IRQs, except for the non-maskable -mask ones, which is a topic for another time. And when you leave the internet handler, you have to re-enable them. And there's two functions in the DOS header, I think. Let's take a look, header files, DOS H, and there should be disable and enable. This is Totally not standard NCC, but perfectly DOS and uh, Turbo C. So the disable function disables interrupts, disables all hardware interrupts except NMI. Because it could happen that during your handling of the sound blaster code, some other trigger goes off, like the timer. And then um, you are writing to the sound blaster card or with the write TSP command or you're writing to the IRQ or DMA controller and everything goes haywire. And that's very bad. So while we are writing to the hardware, we must not be interrupted. That's why we disable all interrupts and at the end of the function, we enable them again. The second problem is that in DOSBox, everything is very fast. For example, input and output is very fast. Uh, before the change, we used to call the read buffer function, which would make a disk access and load the next part of the buffer, that's 16 kilobytes worth of data, and load that into memory. This is extremely expensive. It will take, probably on a slow machine, several milliseconds. And an interrupt handler shouldn't stay for long, because there might be some other hardware needs. And if you disable everything, the machine will get unstable. And that's what we did see here. So actually, it's a stupid idea to do the loading inside of the IRQ routine. But what we can do instead is we introduce a new variable. It's called do read, and it will be defaulted to zero. And it's another one of those volatile variables. Um, here we have it. It's just a character because it just needs to store zero or one. And volatile means it can be changed by an interrupt. So the compiler can't know the value at any given time, because it might be changed via a side effect outside of its control. So instead of really reading the data, we just tell the variable, well, we should be reading something now because our buffer is running empty. So what we're doing here is just set do read to one and do everything else as we did before. If there's only 
very little am amount of bytes left, we do the single cycle playback, or if it's more, um, but not that much, we actually stop the uh, audio init playback. Otherwise, we are done if there's nothing else to be played, etc. etc. You know the drill. And we also swap the buffer variable from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. When we look at the main function now, there was this busy loop, our event loop basically. And before it was just saying while playing and not keyboard hit, do nothing. But now we can actually do something. Namely, if the do read variable suddenly is 1, um, I could also write an explicit one here, but uh, just testing for truth value works as well. If that is set to 1, then we actually do read the buffer and we'll set the do read back to 0. And so we will spend a minimal amount of time in the IRQ handler actually. And uh, since we uh, XOR the R buffer variable in the IRQ handler, we have to do it here again to write to the correct buffer. And when we're not reading, we are now also displaying just a percentage because I wanted to see when the thing gets stuck. And this is not that interesting, but basically um, I'm just waiting for 10 milliseconds here so that I don't do a extremely busy loop, but just let the process sleep a bit. Um, then calculate the percentage and print that stuff. Nothing big, just so that we can see what's going on here. And uh, we can rebuild it, and now with the compact memory model it will also work. So every time this thing, the IRQ fires, it just sets the do read variable. And the main loop here, when it's not displaying the percentage, will load the next block. And this is actually what made everything work, and uh, we can have a quick look on the real machine and uh, see that it indeed does work. Yeah, you can see, now it works. The whole code uh, functions totally fine. And uh, many thanks to Michael who pointed this out. And uh, yeah, this was very educational. We improved our knowledge about interrupt handling and the likes and near and far pointers. So I hope you learned something. Please do hit the subscribe button because uh, we are nearing the 1000 subscribers, the magical mark. And also hit the like button, because then it will hopefully get recommended to other people as well. And if you want, you can drop a coin to my Ko-Fi or Patreon account. If you don't, then it's fine as well. It's just a hobby anyway, but um, I would be very grateful indeed. So I hope to see you next time. Uh, we will continue on our quest to code again. And uh, yeah, I've got a lot of things in store and instead of the usual outro, I'll just let the music run as is from the 386 with the... Actually, currently it's playing on the blaster board card, which is running on port 260, interrupt 7 and DMA channel 3, because I have actually two sound blaster cards in my machine. If that isn't cool, I don't know what is. Have a nice evening.